Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be here this morning. Thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to tell the story. May our hearts be stirred for what you've done in our life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We have a story to tell. We say that and we can understand that when we say we have a story to tell, it could be a number of things, how our our week has went, uh, the birth of a child, a birthday party, something of that nature. And those are gifts that the Lord has given us, but we have an even greater story to tell. For 58 years, Midway Baptist Church has told that story to those who have wanted to hear and to those who have wanted to have their lives changed. We have a story to tell. February 28th to March 3rd, we're going to have six missionary families coming in, and they are going to share how they have went around the world to where God has called them to tell this story and to tell how this story has changed their life and how it can change the people that they're called to their life as well. We have a story to tell. The story which we understand, most of us, is the gospel. That word gospel means good news. It it is plain and simple, Jesus Christ. It is a stripped down sense. It's the good news that only through Jesus may we have eternal life. It is the fact that we are sinners, and because of our sin, that that we deserve eternal punishment. We deserve hell. But because of the, the cross and because of the price of Jesus... He has paid that price. And so for you and I that have accepted that gift of salvation, we understand that our hope is found only in Jesus Christ. It's not adding to anything. It's not because of our talents. It's not because of our abilities. It's not because of money. It's not because of a priest. It's not because of any of those things. It is only because of Jesus Christ. This is the story. It is a story that starts in Genesis, and because of mankind and the the fall, a story of redemption. The central figure in the story is Jesus Christ. We see the promise of a Messiah. We see a baby born. We see a baby that would grow up 30 plus years later who would die on the cross for the sins of mankind. It is the story. It is the only story that matters in light of eternity. We have a story to tell. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 6 are central verses for our conference. This is what the Apostle Paul says. For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. Come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom, a payment for all, to be testified in due time. This is some of the most beautiful verses in the entire Bible. It sums up the gospel. Theologian J.I. Packer would say this, these words contain the key, not merely to the New Testament, but to the whole Bible for they crystallize into a phrase, the sum and substance of the message. Listen, we have a story to tell. Breaking down that story Number quick, very quickly, number one is this. It is a story of brokenness. It is a story of brokenness. We live in a broken world. I think most of us would understand that. What has went wrong was Genesis chapter three. Adam sinned, disobeyed God, plunged humanity into sin, death, and condemnation. The fall would establish this problem that the rest of scripture is written to address. Apart from Genesis 3, we cannot make sense of God's plan of redemption because we as humans cannot stand on our own. It's only through justification in Jesus Christ. We see this brokenness played out throughout the entire Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament as well. Men trying to get to God. Maybe that is your story today as well, trying to get to God on your own terms. We see this brokenness every day in our life, wars, Destruction, heartache, tears. It's a story of brokenness. Romans 5, 12, it's not on the screen, but it says this. Therefore, just as one man in sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men 
because all have sinned. Listen, if that was the end of the story, then we would be in a lot of trouble. But praise the Lord, that's not the end of the story. Listen, we have a story to tell. It is a story of brokenness, but it is also a story of hope. If you were to go back to Genesis again, verse 15 would say, I would put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now that verse gives us a glimmer of hope because we understand that the bruise to the head can be mortal. The bruise to the heel can be temporary. And so we understand from that passage and moving on that there is a glimmer of hope for us. So not only do we have a story of brokenness, but a story of hope. In the New Testament, we have one of the great stories of a man that would follow Jesus. He would be one of his closest followers. He was passionate. He was zealous. He was ambitious. He oftentimes would speak before he thought things through. Well, the story would be told that this man would promise Jesus he would never forsake him. He would go to death for this man. And on one of the darkest nights in world history, this man they call Peter would be asked three times, do you know this Jesus? Were you with this Jesus? Every single time Peter has an opportunity to correct his mistake, his blunder, what he was so confident that he would not do, and yet every single time Peter says, I do not know him. I have no idea who he is. And finally he would curse a rooster would crow and he would realize what he had done. It was perhaps the most likely the lowest moment in his entire life. Hope would come though. In fact, the resurrected Jesus would restore Peter because of his grace and his mercy. Church history would tell us that this same Peter would eventually die on a cross upside down because he was deemed not worthy. He felt it was not worthy to die the same death as Jesus. He would die a martyr's death. He would sum this up in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Peter knew that living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to inheritance uncorruptible and defiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Verse six, in this you greatly rejoice. Through a little while, if need you, have grieved by various trials, the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold and perishes. Verse nine says this, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Listen, Peter had a story to tell and Peter told that story. It is a story of hope. It is a story of brokenness. It is also a story of redemption and restoration. A loose definition of those terms might mean something to this extent, to free something from what brings distress or harm. Restore would mean to put back or to return. In this beautiful letter of Romans that the apostle Paul would write, he lays this out, this idea of restoration and redemption. We would call this sort of a, a nickname, we would call it a Romans road, the Romans road. And I'm gonna read these verses to you again, rapid fire, Romans 3.23. Many of you have heard these verses. If you have not, they are a balm to a sinful and weary soul. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 would go on to say, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love toward us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth the, the name Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. In Romans 10, 13, one of the most beautiful passages in scripture, for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 8, 1 would say this, therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Listen, he is in the restoration and the redemption business. The story that we tell is the story, but it is a story of brokenness. It is a story of hope, 
but it is a story of redemption and restoration. And I know for so many here this morning, your testimony is one that he has restored you. He has redeemed you, that your life has been changed because of the power of Jesus Christ. Listen, we have a story to tell. Marriages being restored, addictions broken, countless stories of being at our lowest of lows. And yet redemption and restoration was there because of the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Listen, we have a story to tell. This story was told by a young man as a teenager. What I needed to know for certain was that I was right with God. I cannot help but admit to myself that I was purposely and empty hearted. Our family Bible reading, praying, psalm singing, and church going, all these had left me restless and resentful. I'd even tried guiltily to think of ways to get out of these activities. I was spiritually dead. And it happened. Sometimes around my 16th birthday, on the night that Dr. Ham finished preaching, he gave the invitation to accept Christ. After all his tirades against sin, he gave us a gentle reminder. God commendeth his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Finally, on the last stanza of the hymn that we sang, I responded. I walked down to the front, feeling as if I had lead weights attached to my feet, and I stood in the space before the platform. That same night, perhaps three to 400 people were there to make spiritual commitments. It was in that moment that a 16-year-old Billy Graham would give his life to Jesus Christ. Billy Graham had a story to tell, and he told it the rest of his life. Not only do we have a story of restoration and redemption, but we have a story of forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, Peter experienced forgiveness. Paul experienced forgiveness. Billy Graham experienced forgiveness. Many, if not most of you, can stand and testify that you have experienced forgiveness in your life. This story that we tell is a story of forgiveness. Missionary Corey Tim Boom tells one of the most powerful stories of forgiveness. If you're not familiar with her, she was from Holland. She helped her family save countless of Jews during the Holocaust. She would eventually go to a concentration, concentration camp. She would see her sister die there. She would eventually be released. And she lived out a, a well-long life into her early 80s, I believe, talking about the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And this is what she says. It was a church in Munich that I saw him. A balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt that had clutched, hat clasped between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I just spoke and moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947. I had come from Holland to defeat Germany with a message that God forgives. It was the truth that they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land. And I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that's where our sins will be thrown. When we confess our sins, I said... God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There was never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood in silence. They clacked at their wraps, and they left in silence as well. And that is when I saw him. He was making his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat. In the brown hat, the next it was a blue uniform and a visor cap with a skull and a crossbone. It came back to me in a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead light, the piles of clothes and shoes in the center of the floor, my sister Betsy walking in front of these guards. Now he was in front of me. He was a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where I'd been sent. His hand thrust out, a fine message from a lean, how good it is to know, as you say, that our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so gullibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take his hand. He would not have remembered me, of course, how he could remember one prisoner among thousands of women, but I remembered him. I remembered the crop swinging on his belt. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with a captor and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. He was saying I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time he went on, I've become a Christian. I know God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. 
but I'd like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraudeline. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? I stood there. I whose sins have been every day forgiven, but could not. Betsy had died in that place. How could he erase that terrible death simply by asking? It could have been seconds, but it seemed hours. But I knew what I had to do. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive their men their trespasses, Jesus said, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. I knew it was not only a command, but it was an experience. Since the end of the war, when I went home to Holland, because of the brutality, those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able to return to a life outside the world and rebuild their lives. Those who were not remain invalids. It was as simple and horrible as that. I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion, and I knew that too. It's an act of the will. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand to the one stretched out. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulders, raced down my arms, sprang into the joint hand, and the healing warmth seemed to flood my whole body. I forgive you, my brother, with all my heart. For as long as I remember, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did that. Listen, we have a story to tell. Corey Ten Boom told that story. It is a story of forgiveness. It is the story of forgiveness, but it is a story of purpose as well. I've said this, if you've heard me say this a lot, you are more than your 70 years on this earth. You were created for purpose. You were created for something greater than money or fame or your job or your family, all of that. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 He who is made alive, who was dead in trespasses and sin, and whence you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who works the sons of disobedience. Verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You raised us up together and made us come to heavenly places. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Listen, your story is a story of purpose. We are called to glorify God. Doesn't mean we've got it all figured out. Doesn't mean we have all the answers, but we are called to glorify him with our life. It is so much more than just punching in the clock and living our 70 years. Listen, we have a story to tell. Finally, we have a story of a bright future. Revelation chapter 21. What a beautiful picture it paints. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. No sorrow, no crying, no pain, for the former things have passed away. Listen, I love the fact that in Genesis chapter 3, we have a picture of brokenness. That in Revelation chapter 21, we have a picture of a bright future. And if your story is one that you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, you've given your life to Jesus, then your future is bright. This world can be hard, it can be bitter, it can be tough, but your future is bright because of Jesus Christ. Listen, we have a story to tell. And finally, it is a story that is personal. And my question for you over these next few minutes is this. What has Jesus done in your life? How has he changed your life? I'm not saying that you got all the answers. I'm not saying that your family situation is perfect. I'm not saying you are the most perfect mom or dad or whatever you might be struggling with. And I certainly understand that because this world can be hard. But my question for us this morning is this. What has Jesus done in your life? How has he changed your life? We have a story to tell. There's a story of forgiveness. It is a story of restoration. It is a story of redemption. It is a story of hope. How has Jesus changed your life? And how are you telling people that Jesus has changed your life. 
Look, I say this in our Next Steps class all the time. You don't have to have it figured out. Your story, your testimony, you just tell people what Jesus has done in your life. You don't have to have every Bible verse memorized. It's certainly good to have those things, but you just tell people what he's done. Every story is personal, and every story is amazing. I was raised by Christian parents who took us to church every week. They sent us to camp, Grace Bible Church in Goshen, Virginia, which when I was nine, I accepted Christ as my Savior. I remember the little small room above the church office feeling the burden of sin and accepted Christ's free gift of salvation as told by one of our church members. I was saved at the age of seven. I had gone to church my whole life. I heard plenty of sermon on the death and resurrection of Jesus, but this particular Easter, I was at the beach with my family. There was a church down there we would attend. I heard the preacher talking about how Jesus loved me enough to die on the cross for me. It wasn't a new concept that I was hearing for the first time, but for some reason, it was different. Again, told by one of our church members. Your story is personal. It is hard to argue against what Jesus has done in your life. If people question or deny, you can say, look, I don't know what to tell you. All I know is this is what Jesus has done in my life. I was walking in darkness and he changed me. Listen, we have a story to tell. These missionaries that are coming are no different than you and I, other than the fact they've been called to another country to tell people about the story and what Jesus did in their life personally and what he can do in their life as well. Listen, we have a story to tell. It is a story that is personal. You gave your life to Jesus at VBS. You gave your life to Jesus at this altar, pulled off on the side of the road in your darkest of moments. Jesus changed your life. When I was a junior in high school, I had a Christian friend who kept inviting me to the youth group at his church. Eventually, with some reluctancy, I went. In that youth group meeting, I heard the gospel and realized I needed to make a choice. That there was an eternal place for me in heaven if I placed my complete faith and trust in Jesus. On February 21st, 1971, thanks to a friend who cared and a wonderful godly youth leader, I made a profession of faith. I gave my heart to Jesus, and I was baptized in San Jose, California. My earliest childhood spent in a home where church was a place that we went with Grandma on Easter Sunday. Until the age of 10, I would have told you that God lived in heaven and Jesus was his son, and that if you were a good boy or girl, you would go to heaven one day. My father suffered from depression and alcoholism throughout his life. And this would periodically cause conflict for my mother and my sisters and I. This led to my parents divorcing, a process that went on from the ages of nine until 11. It was during this difficult period where my parents were separated that my mother was struggling to care for her three children based solely on her income as a nursing home nurse. But I saw a change in my mother. She quit smoking, she seemed uplifted and somehow less exhausted. She transferred energy and kindness into me and somehow made our life seem better, more manageable, despite the fact that there was no change in our circumstances. When I asked her, she told me that she had accepted Christ as her Savior. I didn't understand what that meant, but I would finally start attending church here in North Carolina. A few months later, my mom brought me a set of books called Left Behind the Kids, It was a bridge story of the book of Revelation and Left Behind series. It was meant for middle school readers. The first of the book ends with a powerful message of salvation where the main character accepts Christ as his savior. Reading this passage led me to simply do what he did. I closed my eyes and I asked Jesus into my heart and to my life. I acknowledged my sin and asked for forgiveness. I consider it a miracle and a work of God done through my mother and her salvation And a decision offered those reading materials that directly led to my salvation. Again, as told by one of our church members. Listen, your story is personal. And your story might seem ordinary, but it's not. 
If Jesus has done something in your life, it is something that you and I should want to tell. We have a story to tell. It does not have to be perfect or perfectly said. So not only is it personal, but it doesn't have to be perfect or perfectly said. As I said before, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the fancy theological words. Again, those things are are good and learn over time. But just tell what Jesus has done. I've never written or spoken about my testimony before. I felt like this was a really big deal that would require my undivided attention. But not because of interesting, incredible story, which I don't think I have, because it is the first time that I put it in writing, and I wanted to do a good and accurate job. When I was growing up, I had the best parents, and I still do. They took me and my brother to church regularly from the time that I was born until I was dropped off at college. During my attendance of worship at Sunday school, I learned that when you die, you go to heaven or hell. I eventually told my parents I wanted to go down and accept Christ as my Savior. Soon after that, I was baptized. The weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. That's one of my favorite testimonies because it's the first time this person had ever written their testimony down. Listen, we have a story to tell. I was born into a family with a mom and dad who were both Christians. We went to church and prayed before meals and bedtimes. My young childhood years were anything but what a model Christian family should look like. And if that is your story, praise the Lord that he worked through that. When I was around the age of seven, my parents began having conflict, nasty fights. It was during those times my younger sister and I would be scared and we would hide in a closet. When we were hiding, we would pray because we were taught in Sunday school that God always hears us when we pray. Never underestimate what your children hear, by the way, when they're in classes. Though things outside the closet were not going well, we knew God was protecting us as we prayed. During the rough separation and divorce, I knew I could call on a Savior who could care for me. I felt himself drawing me toward him. And at the age of eight, I knew that I needed to ask Jesus in my heart. I told my mom that I wanted to pray and ask Jesus into my heart. She said, I've been meeting with our pastor and I pray, knowing that a Savior who loved me so much that he died on the cross, he rose again to prepare a place for me. After asking Christ into my heart, I was baptized in 1989. This was the beginning of my Christian walk. Listen, your story doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be perfectly said. It doesn't have to come from a perfect environment. Your story could come from a perfect environment, by the way, that you had parents that raised you in church and that you were saved at a young age. Your story, though, is extraordinary because of extraordinary grace. Your story is extraordinary because of extraordinary grace. Another church member said this, my testimony is what one might call vanilla at first glance. I was raised by Christian parents in a loving home and I went to church since before I could walk and talk. My parents raised me in a Southern Baptist church. I gave my life to Christ in 1980 at the age of 11. I knew I was a sinner and I wanted Christ to change me. I'll always remember standing in front of the church And after publicly letting the pastor know I wanted to get baptized, they would invite folks down from the congregation to to someone who made a decision, and I distinctly remember crying like a baby. I didn't grasp it at the time why I was crying, but I think my spirit knew how important the decision was that I just made. Listen, we have a story to tell. I came to know the Lord at the age of six while attending a tent revival in the middle of nowhere, Virginia. I don't know if it's literally called nowhere. I can still remember vividly the hot summer day, the bright orange and white striped tent, the fire and brimstone evangelist. During that event, a preacher spoke of the brokenness of man and how it separated us from God because of sin. That day I learned the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how receiving him as my Lord and Savior would cleanse me of my unrighteousness. As he spoke, it was like everything I'd done wrong up until that point began to press on my shoulders, and I knew there was not something right with me. Then I heard a small, gentle voice say, come. I knew it was God, and he was telling me that what I was hearing was true. So during the invitation, I stepped out and went forward. A young man sat down with me and walked me through the gospel, and I asked God to forgive me my sins, and I made Jesus Lord of my life. Another one said this, I ended up dropping out of high school in 2010. 
At 18 years of old, I moved out of my mother's home, which really never had any form of discipline or structure, and into an apartment with a childhood friend where I continued to live in the same struggles and sin. At the age of 19, I did some research and I found my birth mother who was living in Florida. After a couple of months of talking with her, I decided to move down there to be with her family for the summer. While there, I found out they were religious. I regularly attended bullpit outreach ministry. And it was that summer that I learned who Jesus was and I accepted him personally as my Lord and Savior. In the moment of brokenness, in the moment of a broken family, a young life was changed. Listen, your story is a story to tell. It is a story of hope. It is a story of forgiveness. It is a story that is personal. It is a story that doesn't have to be perfect, but it is a story of the extraordinary grace of Jesus Christ. And finally, your story is because of Jesus. Every one of these testimonies that I've read, the story of Paul, the story of Billy Graham, Corey Ten Boom, if you notice, none of those stories said anything about you and I. There was never a, well, I knew that it was on me. I knew I had to, it was all about Jesus. And that is the beauty of the gospel. That is the beauty of the story. Every one of us could have a different story, a different testimony, how Jesus has changed our life, but that's the common denominator. I was a sinner. I was broken and Jesus changed me. That's the story. Doesn't matter where you grew up, doesn't matter the environment, whatever that might be, God can still use those things, even at times of difficulty, to change our lives. I was 30 years old when I came to saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. My ex brother in law was giving me tapes from Peoples to Peoples with George. This was a national radio broadcast. I became very interested in the program. I started listening to the radio program. My life was a mess. I heard a lot of people. As I was continuing to listen to the People to People broadcast, Bob George said something that got my attention. He said, folks, I could be lying through my teeth about what the Bible says. You need to read it for yourself. At that point, I started reading the Bible myself and listening to the broadcast. Then one broadcast, Bob George said to the listening audience, have you ever place your faith and trust in Jesus. If you're not sure, why not place the stake in the ground right now? That is when I drop to my knees, I ask the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Then the Lord spoke to my heart and told me I had work to do. The Lord had me go and ask forgiveness for everyone that I'd hurt. It was very hard, but I asked the Lord to help me and I would do it. To my surprise, every single person that I asked for forgiveness would forgive me. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I am honored to serve him the rest of my life. Again, as told by one of our church members. I was abandoned by my mother at a young age. My sister and my brothers were put into foster care. I went to live with my father and my stepmother. I was abused as a child by people who I trusted. I was resnited with my sisters and brothers later with my mother at the age of 15. At at high school, I was married. That marriage would last five years. I was betrayed again. My life spiraled out of control, and I found myself on the floor of my apartment crying out to the Lord. In my time of desperation, my Lord Jesus was there. Restoring the years the locusts had stolen, I gave my life to Jesus. After coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I brought my mother, who was very ill, to live with me. I was honored to lead my mother to Christ, and we were both baptized the same day. I also had the opportunity a few years later to witness to my stepmother. She and my father later came to the Lord before their passing. I have the opportunity to see the love of Christ restore and rebuild lives that were shattered, and I am honored to serve him. Listen, we have a story to tell. It is a story of hope. It is a story of forgiveness. It is a story unique to you, but it is a story that must be told. And I want to encourage you this morning, tell the story. Tell the story of what Jesus has done and tell the story of what he has done in your life. 
It might be simple. Again, it might be I grew up in church and I walked down or in VBS, but that's an extraordinary story because it's extraordinary grace. Listen, we have a story to tell. How has Jesus changed your life? We live in a culture that is hostile toward anyone claiming to know absolute truth. Acts 4.12 says, though, that there is no name under heaven whereby we must be saved, given to people. Our message is exclusive. We tell the world about Jesus. The claims of the gospel are to be made known. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.7, after verse 6, I was appointed a preacher or a herald, an apostle. I am speaking the truth. That word herald there means to proclaim an important message. We are called to herald the gospel. And my encouragement this morning as we get ready for missions is this. We herald the gospel. We tell the good news of Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, the last command to the disciples is what? Go, make disciples. Go. Listen, for you and I, we have a story to tell. Tell the story. Tell the story. Tell what Jesus has done in your life. Tell how he's changed your family. Tell how he has changed the trajectory of your life. I was saved at VBS. God used my mom's salvation to change my life. God used the brokenness of my family to change the trajectory of my life. I pulled off on the side of the road. I was saved during the Easter service in one of these seats. I came down to this altar and I gave my life to Jesus. Tell the story of how Jesus has changed your life. Let's pray this morning. Every head bowed and every eyes closed. If you're here this morning and you would say, Craig, I've never given my life to Jesus, to be honest with you, I don't have a story to tell, then I would tell you this, that is your story. And your story can change today. And you might say, Craig, the whole time you're talking about this, I hear you, but I don't know. Make today your story. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I read through Romans. Because of our sin, we are separated from God. There was a payment for sin. There was that bridge that Emma talked about, and that is Jesus Christ. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus the Lord. If you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus. It is not because of your ability. It is not because of your talents. It is because of Jesus. And I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. It's not anything that I say. It is confessing your sins and putting your faith and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. I would encourage you to pray this prayer to Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner, and I'm coming to you now asking you to forgive me of my sins and I want to put my faith and trust in you for salvation. If that's you this morning and that you've prayed that prayer, and that's part of your story, how Jesus has changed your life. If you're here this morning and you are a Christian, maybe you have never told your story. Maybe you have never shared your testimony. But I want to encourage you this morning. Make it a prayer and make it a desire and make it a habit that when given the opportunity and ask the Lord to give you an opportunity, you share with what Jesus has done in your life. You share that with coworkers. You share that with neighbors. You share that with family. It doesn't have to be eloquent. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just tell people what he's done in your life. That's your story. And embrace that story. It is extraordinary because of Jesus. Listen, we have a story to tell. It is a story that goes to the nations. It is a story for our community. It is a story for our family. It is the story, the story of Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross. And it is a story that should be personal to us. What has Jesus done in your life? We've got to tell that story.
Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your goodness and your faithfulness. Thankful for the opportunity just to gather this morning. I thank you for the greatest story ever told. I thank you for the saving grace of Jesus. Father, I thank you for our church family. I thank you for those that have shared their stories and their willingness to share those stories. And I just pray this morning, Father, for each one of us, Lord, I just pray for those that maybe honestly feel like there's not much to tell. I just pray they would be reminded that if you change their life, that is extraordinary and and powerful. And so, Lord, I just pray that we would have the boldness to share with a lost world how you have changed our lives and how you can change someone else's life. It is only because of Jesus. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.